So, you're the future. Thank you. Because uh, FinFET technology is not going anywhere. I, feel, I even have a feeling that some of the stuff they insist cannot go to FinFET technology. You got a lot of smart people out here. You're going to figure out how to do this in FinFET technology. But it is hard. It is really hard in the layout world to do this technology. Three nanometers, they're very, very strict. If you're working on 12, you got a lot of forgiveness. 16 and 12 forgave you. Once you go below that node, there's no forgiveness in the layout world. The design rules are pages and pages long, and good luck trying to understand what they were trying to tell you to do in those pages. Pray the pictures work, but they really don't work. You just got to figure it out. It's hard. So the number one thing I can say, moving to FinFit technologies, Plan, plan, plan. And if you think you plan enough, plan one more plan. Because if you don't plan ahead, your design is not going to go out the door. Your layout will fail, you're not going to get it out, and you're not going to have working silicon. But I always say I was, um, I, I'm very, very compulsive when it comes to layout. If you told me it had to match, and then you give me a schematic that the, design, the devices won't even let me match, I'm having a conversation with the designer saying, why did you give me devices with such weird sizes when I can't match them? I need them to be nice and pretty, and I will give you first pass silicon. So when it comes to FinFET, if you have a compulsion to be neat and clean, this is where you're going to shine. Because you have to plan ahead. You have to understand. Because you guys have played with FinFETs, right? No? You haven't? Well, when you do, you cannot put a device in analog world in old technologies. I could have a transistor this big, and I can have a transistor this big. And they can sit right next to each other. All you have to do is make sure the metal spacings and the active spacings are correct. No big problem. Uh-uh, fit fit technology, you better step away and this might not even be legal to be in the same block. You're going to have to put transitions in. So you're going to be planning a lot. You're going to decide before the project even starts when you're told this is the specs I got, what size fins am I going to allow in my design? You're going to limit how many fins you can design to. You will not be able to willy-nilly change the number of fins in the L. And that you will have to make a decision. You will stack devices to make them wider. You will not make a big wide one and put because you can't do it anymore. This looks very, very rigid. It is rigid on purpose. You're way below the wavelength of light, and you're trying to use light to make these things. So you, there is no forgiveness. You have to plan ahead. You have to decide on what transistor sizes you're going to allow. What what are these fins going to be? How many fins can I have, and what size are they going to be? And then. I've got my five that I, I'm allowed to use. How many can you use in a single circuit design? And in that circuit design, which two can I play with? What am I not allowed? Because some of these cannot even be in the same field. You're going to have to make go-go's. So there's a lot of planning. Your design rules, the manual used to be, I did 180. That's what I started on was 180. I memorized the design rules. I can't even get through page one of memorizing this stuff because it's, it's basically written in a language that I don't know who understands. They're trying to show you in pictures, and they're trying to sell you in words, and you just don't get it. You've got front end of line rules, you've got back end of line rules, and everything else, and it's really, really hard. So you will spend more, if you're not spending time in meetings, deciding on three things you've got to decide on. What fins you're going to use, the sizes, and who can play in what schematic together. You're going to decide, what are you going to call power and ground? I hate it when you guys are at the same company, and you call power VDD, he calls power PWR. And I'm supposed to, no, figure that out at the beginning. What are your power and ground names? <laughs> it drives layout crazy when you name power and ground. 20 different names, of each one of you name your own power and ground, and it's going to go on the same chip. No, figure it out. What are you calling power at the beginning? Because you need to know that. What are your power and ground nodes? Do you have a digital power? Do you have an analog power? How are you separating them? Don't tell me you're going to have digital and analog, but you don't have a triple well to separate them. If you don't have that triple well, you're just fooling yourselves. Just tell me you're trying to clear a zone because you're going to short through substrate without a triple well. Um, basically, your runtime and your whole growth, this thing just it exponentially blew up. We are working as hard as we can. Basically, the foundries are trying to get this stuff to give you decent yields. We are working with the foundry on a daily basis trying to make sure our tool can give you the best results possible because this is so hard. We have to automate it. We cannot have you sitting there moving over 0.7 microns. Right? That, it's impossible. We need you up looking down at it. So we're developing placement tools for you. That, and we're telling you, you need to come up with a plan. You need to come up with a plan with the size of the devices. 
We will then be able to build you tracks to tell you, okay, these devices go in this track. We'll place them in there for you. And then we're asking you to make these WSPs so that you don't have to worry about routing. So when you go to route, you just click and go, and it automatically snaps you. If you're on Metal 3, it'll slap you to a Metal 3 track, and you go. And, it, and you don't have to think about it, because if you're having to zoom in to make sure you're DRC correct, I'm telling you, if you're zooming in to a transistor to find and figure out how to connect it up, you've already failed. You fail. You are not going to get DRC correct. I'm placing three transistors. You will, you will spend all day getting that one, those three transistors DRC correct. So you need to think about it because you've, I'm sure you've already studied what a fin is, right? So I'm not going to go through the academics of fins. Um, it's basically just we're surrounding it. You've got now, these were the first ones that came out where you just had it on three sides. Now they're surrounding the whole thing, right? So as you go smaller. So it's just the fins. They're colored, right? Each mass, they cost a fortune to make. Here's your different kinds of fins that they're making out there. You guys are probably going to be playing with this stuff here. You're all smart kids. You are the future. So like I said, 28, we started seeing problems. 16 was a little forgiving. 16 doesn't even require you to color it. But guess what founders found out? When they take on that responsibility, if, I, if you have a sensitive net and you have a matching net and one of those nets went on red and the other one went on a green pattern mask, the parasitics are different. Guess what? Your chip may not work. So at 16, they said, eh, we'll do it. Founders no longer do that. You will color it. Coloring means that when you're done, each one of your um, metals are either on a red, green, or whatever color they have. So if you're red, green, colorblind, we apologize ahead of time, but that's what they did. <laughs> but um, that's the normal mask. I don't know. Some of these have triple masks on them. I don't know if they called it yellow or what. But um, so all of this stuff comes into play. The fin fat, the middle of line, the end of line, back end of line. You've got all of these weird things that are now playing a part. That's why, as designers, you've got to plan ahead. Because your layout is the part that's going to kill your circuit. If you don't get it laid out right, you don't do it correctly, number one, you're never going to get DRC clean. And the, the effects of the parasitics on it, if you're not matching things, are going to blow this thing out of the water, and it's not going to work. Your designs will look very much like a gridded sheet of paper. Because what does the foundry want to do? They, they just want to strike the whole thing with metal, each direction, all of them. They want that entire chip to be, be striped, starting from the poly, over. They just want a stripe of it, and you take away what you don't want. That's what they really want you to do. And they don't want to break those lines or move those lines. They'd like to just strike that whole silicon. So poly requirements, the lengths, the interpretation, you can't just willy-nilly. They're going to be numbers. There, there's no half numbers. Hold. It's all a whole number now. you got to make sure there's spaces between different regions. If you want to waste space, don't plan ahead and use every kind of poly length and poly thin size you want and find out how much transition space you're going to have to use. You're going to have to make sure that part of the planning is, I built my block, great, I got a D or C OBS clean. Now you're setting it next to another block. Oh, I, gotta put, I can't even set them next together. I got to make some transition stuff. You're going to have to decide what is our transition device. What device size am I going to use to transition? That means you've done your circuit, now you got to put in your spacing to go to that transition so that when the next block comes in, you can set them right next to each other because they're the same size transition devices. If you don't do it, they could have used one side of fin, used a different side. Now you got to, who's going to build the transition between them? Your blocks are done. you got to get another person to figure out who's responsible for that part. You don't want that when you're trying to assemble blocks. That's part of the planning. What's the transition? What do I surround everything with so that when I put this next to the next block in my chip, they can just sit next to each other because I've already got the same transit, the same size device sitting there. Am I making sense to you? It's, it really is that difficult that you've got to plan this stuff. And the minute you don't, and like I said, I watched a company. They were zooming in to route things. I said, you're going to fail. They are one year late and they, because they thought they knew. And it's like, no, we are not making this stuff up. We are working with, you guys are all really, really smart. And the companies out there doing FinFed technologies are really, really smart. They've learned. Everyone learns. We're trying to help you not make the same mistakes that we've all made. And the, the fusion breaks alignments, all of this stuff. There's a lot of stuff going on here. And they, the foundries are working really, really hard. First generations of these, the, um, you might even get some older PDKs where their P-cells were even a mess. They, they had DRC violations in them. The foundries are having a hard time getting this stuff right. And we're working very, very hard with these foundries to get this technology to work. So you can see in here, they didn't pay attention to 
a lot of stuff. And look at the densities they're trying to work with. And they have this, this is where I was talking about a transition. Different size stuff, I have to transition away from it. That's a waste of space. That's not active circuitry. That's just dummy stuff sitting in there. Because my active stuff is in here, and I have different poly densities, so I have to have all this stuff to keep it away. I have to keep things away from things. Because I'm not allowed to put, I, I can't put certain different size fins next to different sizes. Remember, what's the foundry want? They would love it if you made one fin size and used it through the whole chip. They would be so excited. You'd probably get a really good yield. But it's impossible to do that. You have to have some changes in your um, transistors, but you've got to limit that change. And then basically, there's new ways. You, you, if you're going to do same spec, if you're going to have mask on the same color, there's a different spacing. This is why it gets so small, because we can put metal one on green and metal one on red, and we can get a lot closer with that metal route, so you can save some space. It's great that you save all the space, but if you didn't pay attention to your transistors, you're wasting all that space in transi transition areas. And then the different masks and stuff, and um, masks, these are, and when you're drawing, you really don't have to worry about these nowadays. Cadence is taking care of this mask stuff. Your WSPs will, you can, metal one will look just the way it looks to you now, and you'll see a little red border on it when it gets into a red track or a green track, but it's still your metal one. But you could actually turn on and see all these as different layers. We don't need them to be different layers anymore. We can do this for you, manage it. Yes, sir. Um, what are red and green tracks? What? What does red and green track mean? That, the red and green are just the colors the foundries picked for the mask layer. Metal one is going to be put on two masks in FinFET. And it's going to, just like you know, metal one and metal two are two masks in the old process, well, your metals, your lower metals, are going to be in two masks. And they picked one is red, one is green. That's it. That's just a color that they use. It could be mask A and B, but somehow they had to tell you the difference when you're visually looking at it. You can't see an A and the B, but you can see red green if you're not colorblind. And then um, anymore, the end of line spacing, you'll notice on here that if I'm going to just stop metals, I have a bigger spacing than if I use what we call cut layers. Because remember what I told you? What's the foundry want? They just want you to cut off with, to disconnect. And this is what they do. They put these layers in now. You have these layers for cutting. So you can get even closer. You don't have to put a space between these anymore. You can just cut them. So that's just showing you that you can cut it. And then there's, there's rules on these spaces here on where they can be and how far away. Like I said, the rules here, like look, there's a DRC rule here. There's a rule right here. There's a rule. I said, you'll never memorize these rules. And the minute you think you got it memorized, they're going to rev the PDK and tell you that we changed it. Because they're finding out they, they got to make their yields better. This is just showing you, here's a single transistor in old technologies, right? This is what it looks like now. You're not allowed to make these big old things. You basically stack this device up. That's that device right here. The difference, and look at how it's symmetrical. You can't build this. You have to build it like this. It is a completely different world when you go to FinFET. And I'm glad you guys are coming up to take the ball. So layout impacts your design. You're going to spend more time now than ever in your layout when you go to FinFET technology. The parasitic effects in just getting it laid out correctly have a significant impact on your design. If you don't plan ahead and expect your layout guy to get it done, or girl to get it done in a heartbeat, you're fooling yourself and you're fooling your company you're going to work for. And you're going to have to build a system. You're going to build, start doing it today. Have a checklist. Even on whatever process node you're working on and you're making a chip, there should be a checklist that you're going through to take this thing out. I had a 40 point checklist to take out. You know why it was 40 points? Because it, Various times in my career, something was skipped and you, you basically wasted mass. So you go through a checklist. Are the laser alignments there? Am I responsible for it? Do I have the logo in, for heaven's sakes? Do I have the numbers that tell me what rev this is? All of that stuff. What are you required to do? You need to have a checklist. The better you put that checklist together from literally, it's why do pilots have a checklist? Because mistakes were made. They have to, before they take that plane off, they go through their checklist. Before you tape out a design or anything else, you build a checklist, both for the schematic side on your simulations and for the layout side. Did I follow everything? Did I run parasitic analysis on all the things I needed to run? 
Did I check everything I needed to do? All of that stuff has to be done. In the FinFET world, your planning ahead is the number one checklist. Did I make a transition device? This is the device all engineers know. This is their transition size. So when you finish your block, it better be surrounded with my transition devices. Or I actually use that size of device for my circuit so I didn't have to add any transition. That's what I designed with, so I don't have to worry about it. Did I decide what my power and ground is? I'll tell you what, if each one of you decide on what your power and ground is and someone's trying to do top level simulation, they're gonna come have a chat with you. Because each one of you, one use PWD, one use VDD, one use VDDDD, one use lowercase, one use uppercase, and never, ever, 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 ever in the industry of this world use case sensitivity as a difference between something. I'm guaranteeing you if you think lowercase VDD and uppercase VDD are a good thing, you are sorely wrong because 90% of the tools will ignore you and are case insensitive. And you are gonna screw yourself because one day you're gonna, yes, you might have a tool set to case sensitive, but most tools won't be. And you're gonna, you're gonna literally hurt yourself. Do not say uppercase inverter, lowercase inverter. They're two different cells. No, they are not. <laughs> they are the same cell. <laughs> so please do not use case sensitivity I've, trust me, I'm telling you from experience. I've worked with it, I've done it. I've, why, why, oh why? And don't have six libraries in there and have the same cell in six different libraries that are you're, you're, you're pulling out devices. Yeah, I pulled my inverter from this library. Well, I pulled my inverter from this library and then you get the top level and you find out, well, I got parameter problems. Well, they're supposed to be the same inverter. They're named the same, no, they're not. Mine was slightly different. I used a different size transistor and now who's right? So do not do that. That kills layout when you have the same libraries with the same cell in it and you pick from one library and you pick from another. It's part of the checklist. You run a, I actually run in the layout, I run a tree. I go, and I check which library are those devices coming from. They better only be coming from two libraries, the reference library and maybe another library that you have. But that's it. There should be no other library. It shouldn't be coming from Bob's old copy. Because Bob made an old copy and wanted to run some tests. Well, you can't use Bob's old copy. You need to move it into the regular project library, okay? Yes, sir. Okay. So in industry, how uh, you will share the same library, right? To yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. They're design sync. But people always make copies of it. Because you, as a, a, a stu student, are thinking, you know what? I need to test something. And you're going to go off and build it. And you say, oh, it worked. And then you're going to tell someone, say, use mine. It's really good. But you forget to put it back in the real project. Guess what? They used yours, and now we're getting ready to tape out. You can't do that, because what if you decide to delete your library? Now you get a blinking thing on your um, layout. It just blinks, blinks, blinks. Not, well, you weren't supposed to use mine. Well, you forgot to copy it over. It happens. Trust me. Checklists. Checklists and planning, because this will happen to you. It will happen to you. I am surprised every day when silicon comes back working. We are a lot of brilliant people, but we do stupid things. <laughs> we think we're brilliant, and we outsmart ourselves. So you have to make yourself a checklist. Leia always catches this. We catch it and stuff. And I'm literally, we just worked with a company, and I've got to go back to our company. Because one product is telling you guys to do it one way, and it's destroying our part of the flow. So now I've got to go back to these guys and say, hey, you need to do it virtually. We can't mess with the real layout. But it's lessons learned. It's, they never thought about it. But in the layout world, you find every mistake. You will find every mistake that happened in the schematics. If you use the device that's incorrect. Never, ever, ever in the schematic do you queue a PMOS device and change it to an NMOS device. And just do a queue and change it. Because guess what? You broke the callbacks for that device, and that's going to fall apart. You, when you go to run an LBS and a DRC, that is going to fall apart. You're going to have corrupted data everywhere. Most of the software now, we stop you from doing that. But sometimes, some, there's some clever engineer out there, you guys are smart, will find a way to just queue a device and be too lazy to change a PMOS to a PMOS 4. You'll just put a number on it. No, you can't do that. You've got to go create instance and drop that 4. There's code behind it that fill in all those callbacks and all those parameters. There's skill code being used. You just change that. None of that skill code got triggered. And you just corrupted everything. I've seen it all. You guys are smart. You'll find ways to shoot yourself in the foot. I guarantee it. And, someone, and you don't want to be in front of your boss explaining why you corrupted the database and why they spent three days trying to debug why this thing wouldn't LBS because it wouldn't make a netlist. And it's because you were 
clever enough to just do a queue and change the number instead of being too lazy to go click instance and drop a new instance. Um, so let's see. Basically, whoops. Here is what you were allowed to do, right? You guys are doing older process nodes. You've seen all this, right? Look at the different sizes of these transistors, the thicknesses, all this. Well, you're not going to do that in the FinFET world anymore. Number one, um, everything is a fin. Your cap is a fin. This is what it looks like here. You can see they got some cap rows in here, outage. They got some fill in here. This one doesn't have any kind of escape, so they didn't put any transition devices. Maybe this is the size they decided to use to transition out of, too. But this is the difference. Look at the difference in that circuit. Look at how much patterning this is. The closer you get everything to match, you're guaranteed to get good yields and matching for your circuitry. If you did something like this in FinFET, you, this thing will fall apart. They won't be able to make this is matching, where your devices are really, really tight. They all match. That's what you want. You want this thing to look like it's all the same. Because remember, the foundry would love for you to pick one transistor size for N and P and just go. So they, get, they could just stripe this whole thing and just take out the, you know, the, use the cut layers and cut it out. That's what they want to do. Examples of some of the designs. Does this look like anything you've laid out lately? No. <laughs> I'm looking at your eyes and it's like, no, my stuff doesn't look like that. But look, at how, look, how, look how stringent they are. You can see there's some differences over here, but there, there are spaces in between and stuff. But look at how striped this is. Like I said, this is the new way of layouts are going to look. They're not going to look like that old slide that you had. Now, some of you may go into RF work and things like that where this might look, you know, you can still get away with that. I have RF guys still pushing polygons. It drives me nuts. But um, we'll show you how not to push polygons anymore. But um, basically, this is what you're going to be going into in the industry. Is This is what the layout, and it takes a while to do this. This is not something that's easily done. And then you've got to analyze all of this stuff. So that's where, you know, I'm sure you've already talked from Shruba and stuff on the simulator, being able to be sped up to take in all the parasitics and do some reductions so that you can actually simulate this, right, the post-processing, post-layout simulation. Because when this, on these nodes, you will do post-processing simulations. Maybe in some of your older technologies. I got, I, I literally, one of the engineers I worked with, he sat down next to me and I wrote some skill code to measure the length of my wire and I, you know, take a ruler and say how wide it was. And he hand calculated the parasitic resistance on that thing. He had calculated caps and things like that. He was an old process, you could get away with that. And his rule of thumb, if it was really super, super sensitive, we put it in the center of the die. We put it right in the center of the IC. That was the most sensitive thing we had. Because he said that's where the highest yields are. So floor planning, placement, key. You plan right here. And this floor planning is also the plan of device sizes, transitions, everything else. What transits, what's what size fins can you put in the same circuit? What are you allowing? So if, if, uh, if you're going to do layout, you should only expect two different size transistors, and they should be this size, because you've already done some preliminary work with someone. Because you're literally going to do preliminary design work. You're going to try to design something and see how long. Just a simple, you could take a simple flip-flop and try to design it. You won't design, one thing to note, you will not design to standard cell rules unless you're working on standard cells. I have a company trying to make their own standard cells in FinFET technology, and they are, they are just not doing well. The standard cells and all of that is a whole set of different rules that they abide by. So get your third party foundry, or get whoever you're buying your standard cells from and doing it. If you're going to be that standard cell de uh, designer, you're going to have a whole different set of rules you're going to be working towards. But um, because they, they have special layers just to identify standard cells so that they can actually know that it's a standard cell and these are the design rules we use so for it. That's how different this technology is. That standard cells are even done with a different, with a different mask on them so that they, we know this is a standard cell and we use these DRC rules. And so, so you're going to plan ahead. You'll do some placement. You'll, you have to start running DRC right here. We have built into a virtuoso. Um, PVS and Pegasus, so depending on what node you're on, it's, there's, we call it IPVS or IPegasus, that it's, you're going to run sign off DRC rules, you're not re relying on the tech file to start right here. And they'll have a set of subset of rules that are just based on basically your placement rules. You can get rid of all your top metal rules because you're not even doing top metal. You'll get the base DRC done on this before you even go to routing. Because if you place and 
start routing and then run DRC, you're going to take all that routing on anyway because this is probably not even correct, just the placements. So all your routing is worthless. So you will place devices, start running DRC once you place the first few fins. And then once you've got the DRC good, then you can start routing. And once you've got it all done, when you get out here, you shouldn't have any surprises because you're going to do interactive DRCs all the way along. So when you get to here, you should be surprised by DRCs. You might have, down in here, you might be waiting some density checks and not running them. But when you get to the top level, you should be surprised by any of the lower level rules. You should only be worrying about density rules at the top in LVS. So. But your LVS, we, if you're connectivity driven routing, who's heard the term connectivity? Connectivity driven. Excel compliance. Anyone heard it? When I, as a layout designer, we're going to use it to, remember I talked about what's in EXL, but in basic layout, just going to build this out, is you build a schematic. Now you're going to build the layout. In your schematic, if you're doing the same, if you're one and the same, go to your top, go launch, layout, Excel. Boom! It's going to open up a layout window. Now you got a layout window open. Now you can do two, one of two things. You can go to the bottom of your layout if you haven't messed and turned off all the toolbars. There's a toolbar down in the bottom. Gen from source or pick from source. You can do a gen from source. You can decide, am I going to just throw in the instances, the PR boundary? Am I going to bring the pins in? Yada, yada, yada. And then you do that. If you decide, well, I only want the instances and I'm not even going to put a PR boundary in yet. Then you hit boop and it throws on all your instances and dumps them to the bottom. Now they're linked. You click on it in the layout. It's highlighting in the schematic. That's exactly what you want. You want to be able to look at your schematic, click on something, and then highlight in the layout. If you're not doing that, you're basically working, like when I started in 1997 doing this stuff, and you might as well get a paper route and print that thing out on a piece of paper and start taking a ruler, a uh, colored pencil, and coloring it in as you route it and place it. That's how I used to do it. When you're in, um, the, the further you get in the advanced nodes, you, um, everything will be colored. And you're, you'll be working with WSPs so with list based tracks. You won't even have to think about it. They're going to be colored. All that stuff's going to get colored. And you won't pass DRC without it. Yes, sir? Uh, in industry, how many button layers are currently being used? Uh, it depends on which founder you're using and what process nodes you're at. I've worked on process nodes that have four metals. I've worked on process nodes that have 11 to 12, 13 metals. So it just depends on the foundry and the process. So usually when you're up in the high metals, you're not worried about these rules anymore. They're, it's all top level interconnect at that point. It's your lower um, three and down below that you're really worried about this stuff. And they're definitely um, gridded. And so you can see that if you plan ahead, this is, you can get a nice looking design like this and you'll probably get a better yield. All your polys and everything are the same. Your density is the same. And this is what you want. You want stuff as close as possible so that you can match because the parasitics of this stuff is a mess. And if you want something to match, you need it to look, you need to look like it matched. Right? It's got to be pretty much the same stuff. So we have built a lot of uh, automation indoor tools to help you with that. Plan your device sizes, uh, define your rows, and use WSPs. Because if you're literally zooming in to place these things, you failed already when you're at FinFET. You should have uh, rows defined based on your sizes. We can, uh, if you have a certain fin size, our tool is smart enough to know based on that fin size we can use this row. All you have to decide is how far off the row. Are you going to offset it a little bit inside the row or not? And usually the founder will even tell you what that offset is. And then WSPs, we have ways of automating, automating some of this, but it's not too hard to build these up for you. So if you have a special way of routing where you want, you know, two, you, you want two wide ones here because you're, that's your power and ground rails. You can set those up. And any more in FinFET technologies, you just can't widen up metals. We call what's called stranded routing. We actually stripe your metals. If you need to have something 2x wider, you take two tracks and you route on two tracks. You can't just willy-nilly make this stuff wider. There's limits and there's all those rules about it's this long and this wide, it has to be this far away if it goes this long or if it's this so, this, so there's so many rules, that's why you have these WSPs. If you, if you need it wider, you take up two tracks. Route it on two tracks. Let's see, next slide. This is just kind of showing you. Um, in here, you can see these green dots are the poly tracks. Polys will always snap to a grid. Polys, um, if you don't have these fin grids on, you will, um, when you go to clay something, it will always, you'll kind of feel this pull. It's gonna force you to put it on these tracks. 
they have to remember they want to stripe this whole thing, right? So you're going to put it on a track. And this is the roll. This blue area right here is a roll. And we, we can automate this based on the size of this. We have a flow that just says, okay, this is my transistors. These are what I want. And we can actually even go in there and build you mod gens and everything else automated. Because we know what certain devices look like. We know what a current mirror looks like and everything else. We can auto abut these and everything else and get you some of this stuff done. But you can see you can adjust your row heights and then you know you got your spacings in here, but everything snaps. You snap on the you snap on in the um, this x direction. You slap you you'll snap in the y direction too. Everything should snap because if you're having to zoom to put this on the right spot, you fail. It should if you did it right and you're doing the process and adhering to your plan, the tool will automate this because we don't want you having to do this. This is time consuming and it's really hard. We can do this part for you automated. You get the hard part. You got to come up with the design. This is just showing you, this is kind of an example of a WSP where they, they built their tracks in here and they have slightly wider ones for your power grounds. And this is just saying, you know, they have different ones, right? Remember, you're working on circuitry. You could have WSPs, like they say, low C, high R, or low R, right? Depending on what you're designing, this is where you build your different tracks based on that. And then you just determine, and the best thing to do is your WSPs is understand and name them so it makes sense to you why they should pick that. WSP underscore six means nothing to nobody. But if you say it, WSP low current, or low C or low R, that makes sense. So someone knows, when you tell them this is a low R circuit, then they can know which WSP, not, well, I'm gonna pick eight. Well, what's eight mean to me? It doesn't mean low current, or low R or something. So try to name things that make sense too. And uh, again, this is just kind of showing you um, Generating all devices, choosing a device set, add rows. The more, um, use mod gens. Uh, mod gens become, how many have used mod gens in this room? Ever even heard of the term mod gen? Nope, okay, module generator. It is a layout tool that, um, let's say you want to build something and you want to interdigitate it, right? You want A, B, C, A, B, C, or A, B, B, A, right? That's the pattern you would like in four rows. You've got M factors, right? You have two divided, and you want A, and this is how you want A, B, B, A. Well, with the Mongen, you can bring those into layout, turn on the Mongen, and we have on-campus Mongen, so you don't have to turn on the module generator tool, and you actually can turn on a pattern grid, bring up the grid, it will give you the letters to corresponding to the various devices. That's why I say A, B, because we'll assign a letter to the devices. There's a little map down below that tells you what device, and you can build that pattern in that, and it will automatically put your transistors, move all those transistors into that pattern for you. You, build, you write the pattern, boom, it, they're placed that way. You can add dummies around it. You could go A, dummy, B, B, dummy, A, if that's what you want. And you could write that pattern. A dummy in that pattern grid tool is a star. A blank, if you want to put a blank in between something, is just a dash. In that. It's like a mini Excel spreadsheet that is a pattern grid. And you can make your own patterns and you can save them off as templates and everything else to reuse. But that's the Majin and it's used heavily in here so that you, again, we don't want you hand placing thing or hand trying to interdigitate this stuff. We can automate that stuff for you. And we will automate as much as we can. And you can kind of see back in here, this is moving along and it's snapping. It's gonna force a snap. You'll see how it kind of clunks. It's not the slowness of the movie or anything. It's snapping because it's trying to drop it's got horizontal lines that it has to snap to, and it's got those vertical fin grids that it has to snap to. So that is to help you from making DRC violations. You need to stay on a pitch, and that's why you can't change, whoops, sorry. That's why we have a hard time. You can't change the length of this transistor because that changes this pitch. That's why you have to decide ahead of time because this pitch needs to be consistent. And when it's not consistent, you have to transition out of this pitch to a new pitch. And the same thing when you're going up and down. There's a pitch here. If you're changing this width, now you've got to go in there and change that pitch. And they don't like doing that in the FinFit world. That's why you decide ahead of time which ones are allowed so that, and you've already practiced. If you're going to have two different sizes, you already know they'll work and you can get a DRC. And you have a test run that shows you can get a DRC clean. And however you did that test run is how you have to do the real circuit then. 
It's because you've already decided, okay, if we're going to do this, then we have to have this kind of spacing and this kind of transition. So you know what space you're giving up. You don't want to be surprised when you're working on your real circuit just how much space you might have to waste. Question? Yes, sir. Here. Uh, so, um, so you mentioned about the, the snapping mm -hmm. or the track. So we, uh, we okay, this, this was my first experience. I don't know if that makes sense to you. So when you take several transistors and you make that to be another hierarchy, let's say you make another scale out of the several transistors, we're going to do the layout. Then the snap will just disappear. It'll all get snapped to the zero and zero. Do you know what I'm saying? Just Not really, because these are device placements. Yes. When you get to a block placement, you don't really. No, so I was saying, let's say you have five registers right. in the layout, then you want to make three of them at another hierarchy. So you, you, you select three of them, you click edge, the hierarchy, and then you can make that in another cell. You want to make cell? Yeah, something like that. Then, you will, then the snap will basically disappear. And Right, that's why, um, why when you're going to make another cell, yeah. you don't decide to make it in the layout. You make that cell in the schematic and work with it within, you should not. Remember I said Excel compliant? Layout, don't make a cell. If you don't have that cell in the schematic, make it a group. We see through groups. Don't make another cell in the layout that doesn't get, exist in the schematic. You just broke Excel compliant. You can no longer probe those devices. You can no longer find those devices. It doesn't exist. You either have to set it to transparent, which is a pain in the butt, um, or you just make it a group. If you need them grouped together because it's easier to move, then group them together. If you need to make another cell, go back to the dang schematic and make a new cell, and then add, now you combine them. But don't willy-nilly. In the industry, I just had to remind a designer to, yesterday, in the industry, the schematic is considered golden. The layout is not considered the perfect end. You don't make changes in the layout that are not reflected in the schematic. You don't change the size of devices. You don't add devices and then forget to put them in the schematic. Number one, you're never going to get LVS clean. But the schematic is considered the golden tool. Everything compares. When you run an LVS, it's layout versus schematic. One is assuming the schematic is right and the layout was where the mistake was. If you're going the other way, good luck. Because you've just modeled one thing in the schematic, now you're being thrown a post-simulation netlist for the layout, and you're wondering why your simulation is out of whack. Well, hello, you're not even simulating. You're simulating an apple to an orange. They're not going to be the same. Schematic is golden. All right? So as a layout designer, there are many times, remember I told you I was really compulsive, but if you told me to match and you gave me transistor sizes like that one I showed you where everything was all off, well, how they have, that's not matching to me. I would go back to the designer and say, let's have a talk. Do you really have to have this big old fat thing in this? If you have to have it, does it have to be in this block? Because you really wanted me to make this nice and pretty. And I can't make it pretty with this big old fat thing sitting in the middle. Or this little tiny thinny, skinny thing sitting next to all these other big things. Come on. You wanted me to make it pretty. Let's negotiate. Can you stack some devices and split this thing down, right? But you negotiate. You don't just, as a layout designer, I would never willy-nilly change anything because there's model differences between sizes of devices. And I need you to know what I laid out so that when, the, when I give you my post-layout simulation extracted view or extracted netlist, it's going to simulate the way you expected it. If I just willy-nilly decide to change the sizes of the transistors and fold it because it just laid out easier without telling you, your simulations might not match. And you're wondering why, and it's because I changed the size of the device. The schematic is considered golden. Match the schematic. If you're making hierarchies, I didn't care back in the day. I made hierarchies because that was an easy way to manage things, but we didn't have Excel compliant. Now if I need to keep a group of transistors because they're a group and I want to keep them as a group, I don't do a make cell. I make a group. And I name it like if it was M4 that happened to have 100 transistors in it. It was an in instance, M4, instance I1 had an M factor of 100. Well, that's a lot of transistors to keep track of. So I'll probably abut them, get them all done, and I'll make it a group so that when I have to move it, I can move the whole thing all at once. But it doesn't screw up. I can still cross probe it. I did not screw up the hierarchy of the schematic or the layout. A group, and then I will name that group because by default we'll start with group zero, underscore zero. I'll name it I, I5 or whatever that instance number was. So that way when I queue it, oh, I know what device this is, even though I can cross probe it, but I, I like no queue, I like signals. 
and I'll say I whatever underscore group zero or whatever. I still underscore it with a group so I know it's a group. Make sense? Don't make levels of hierarchy in the layout that don't exist in the schematic. If you need those levels, then go back to your schematic and edit it. It's a lot easier to edit a schematic than it is a layout. When you screw up in a schematic, you just move a line. When you screw up in a layout, you've got to move a whole bunch of things. Just because you decided that, oh, I want this transistor to be you know, X bigger, well, that could mean a whole rip up of a whole layout. Just because you grew it just a little bit could mean I have to rip up my whole layout. It took you two seconds to queue and change the size. It's taken me all day to change it. That's the impact, especially in FinTechs. It could happen. So be careful. Um, just kind of going everywhere because this is data sheets, electrical data sheets, yada, yada, yada. All of this matters. Let's just get through this because, well, we're doing all right. Questions for you guys. This is the new way of work. Now, there's been some work on this. This is early, this slide was. But this is when I was telling you we want you at the 100 foot level, not at the nanometer level, doing layout and FinFET technology. This is the start of it. Um, this is where we have in the EAD, or EXL tier, remember it's an EXL because it's an advanced feature, is we give you this new um, assistant. And it's the um, auto place and router. This is for FinFET technologies where you initiate, this is kind of like the gen from source. You, you can walk down this thing, or you can go through them on the tabs, however you want to do it. But you click through it, it'll initiate, bring all your transistors down here. Then you join it, when you hit this one, we'll go through it here. It'll, make the it'll have a constraint thing, where we can say, okay, this, is, this looks like a current mirror, these look like they should match. Let's put these in this, and it'll add constraints, and it'll, it'll group things together. We'll do that auto for you. Then we'll go in there, and remember, we gotta create rows. Based on your fin size, we're gonna create some rows. And then, we're gonna, um, then we can do the placement of the devices. We could actually fill in. We could do some fill, because remember, that whole area has to be filled in. There's polydensity bolts. You've got to fill it all in. We'll auto fill it in for you. And we can route these devices too in it. We can turn on the auto router. So let's just kind of click through this. So that's, and this is just kind of, again, this is, if you haven't seen it in the layout world, you do have the navigator too. And so you can click on things and they will highlight the nets and stuff like that. This over here is just your routing system. This probably will not look the same in a while from now. This is, we are working a lot on routing, auto routing, and because of the FinFET technologies and just routing in general. It's not easy in the analog world because everyone in the analog world believes their designs are the Mona Lisa of the world. And they have their own special secret sauce. And Virtuoso has to handle every one of your secret sauces. But even, but even with your secret sauces, there's limitations in the FinFET technologies. Secret sauce at 180 nanometers was significantly different for each company. But the process nodes are huge. There is a lot of forgivenesses. In FinFET, your secret sauce is a little less secret because everyone has to do certain things a certain way. But how you make something could still be secret. What si how you decided to make whatever widget you're making is the secret. It's not the layout part of it. This is all going to be followed by the same rules. You're still limited by the same physics. But this router, this is just showing the router and stuff like that. Power grid, just, I don't even know if this is playing a video. Yeah, we're going to just go in there and show you how you can hook up stuff. Any questions so far? How many of you actually have done layout yourself? How many enjoy doing it? <laughs> if you like stacking a closet, it's a great thing to do if you like to have a nice neat closet. It is a necessary evil for those of you who don't like it. So a lot of places nowadays, you're not given the um, nicety of having a layout designer at your disposal. You may do, be doing, even in the industry, your own layout work. Um, if you get a layout designer, please respect them. It's not easy, especially in the FinFET world. And They've got a lot of experience. Any layout designer that knows what they're doing can tell you right away whether or not your circuit will even work just by looking at it. They're good enough to look at a design and know. And they'll, they don't know garbage. They'll probably be polite and lay out your garbage. But they know bad schematics when they see it and everything else. And you're going to be talked about because they're going to be calling us trying to figure out how to get around your shortfalls. And they're definitely going to be calling you out if you do a queue on a device and change it by just changing it and not actually placing a new instant and screwing up all the callbacks. This is just showing you um, the power router. And you can see, this doesn't look like any power router you did in your layouts, right? 
very straight, very thing. Remember, these metals don't change directions. If they're supposed to be vertical, they're vertical. If they're supposed to be horizontal, they're horizontal. They do not change. Um, Ian, this is how many, you guys, Shruba, have you showed them EMX yet? Uh, no. So okay. The session on December 1st, next week we do not have a session, so it's been saving. But December 1st we do Virtuoso Multitech, uh, which will segue from what you are talking about, uh, EXL, with yep. Virtuoso Multitech, and we will present EMX and clarity. Good. So this is um, basically, yes sir? When you spoke about uh, like having a metal in a specific direction, let's say north, south, or east, west, how do you place the vias? Like they have to be placed. Um, if you look at the new fins, the vias don't have the overlap that goes all around the vias. They're, they're, the metals on the vias don't even change directions. They're different kind of vias and fin fit technology. So you don't see that. Older technologies, yeah, metal one is supposed to route in the um, vertical direction, but when you place a via to go to metal two, and it was you're going this way, you're it turned direction. You don't get the the vias don't look the same anymore. There are different kind of vias when you go to FinFET, so they do not have that overlap like that, so they won't change directions. So basically, this is um, EMIR. Uh, basically, this is a new integrated one. EMX is a standalone tool. It's also integrated into Virtuoso now, so you can actually go in there and run this. This right here, though, is this is EAD. Whoops, sorry. Remember I was telling you about the simulation driven routing where you, you can simulate, get it, and start routing? This is, before we invented that, we had this. This is the electrically aware design. This is for looking for EMIR. This is where you've given it some process inter information, and as you're developing your layout, you can extract it. You don't have to go out to DRC. You don't have to go out and get it LBS clean and completely done to start extracting a pair of cities. This is done in design. It's basically, it's not as accurate as your sign off, but it should get you there. You shouldn't find big surprises when you get to sign off. If you blew it with the parasitics here, going to a sign off tool isn't going to make it any better. You probably blew it there too. This is, um, it only checks your interconnect and stuff. So it's a way of calculating real quick your um, coupling and your R's, and it will give you EM um, violations too. So that you can say, oh, I need to up my V account. I got, you know, I've got all this amperage coming through and I got a single V. It's going to burn that V up. So you can find that violation. There's a calculator built in so that you can go in there and do what ifs and whether or not I can, what metals I should do and stuff like that. So this is all built into Virtuoso. And there's, um, you guys use the, any of the rapid adoption kits that we have in the support.cadence.com website? All right, if you haven't heard of it, who goes to support.cadence.com? Great, well you should all have a login to that. And um, basically any one of these products or flows you want, odds are, we've got what we call a rapid adoption kit. And that is basically, you want to learn how to use EAD. We've got a Cadence PDK that you can download and a PDF document that will step you through how to use any of these tools. It's a good way, so if you want to learn how to use that, remember I showed you that router thing? You can go out there, oh, is there a, a step through? We'll have a, we have a generic Cadence PDK for FinFET technologies. You could step through the placement of that stuff. Because you're not going to remember every tool that we have. But the, the greatest thing is, even if you don't want to use our PDK, we gave you a book that steps you through how to use the flow. Grab that PDF document. Step through it. If you want to learn how to use modgens, go out and get a rack for it and just step through the modgen. You don't have to download our PDK. Use your own design and practice with your design. If it says select these transistors, select your own transistors and do it to those. That's the easiest way to learn. I have customers all over the world. They just download the PDF because it's a cookbook. It tells them how to do it. They use their own stuff. They don't go out and get our eggs. They use their eggs at home. And they, so use your PDKs. And then if you're, you can find out if you're missing something in your PDK, then you call your local AE and they'll tell you, yeah, that, that PDK wasn't built to handle this. And then you can file a ticket to whatever foundry you use and say, hey, can you enhance this so we can have this? Most things don't anymore don't miss anything out of their technology files for doing some of the automation. But, uh, um, yes, sir. Actually, I was about to ask this question. Actually, last time also I went to support.cans.com. It says contact your local uh, uh, faculty uh, uh, when I registered with my cadence uh, with my USC ID. It says that uh, contact your uh, uh, your faculty person. Uh, I don't know like what is like. Uh, there, if there's a 1-800 number or email, just email them. Because sometimes I don't know how it works with universities. Because I've had customers, you worked at 
let's say you worked at Northrop Grumman, right? And now you're going over and you're working at another company and you've got to get their host ID and everything else. And then they're saying, well, now you got two logins and stuff like that. So you got to, I don't know why you're, but just send the ticket out to them and stuff like that. But yeah, you want to be in support. We have all these three professors that can quite take this certificate of support. Uh, professor Sederos, Professor Hossein, and uh, Professor Shaheen. So no students can file a ticket. Okay, well then go to whoever can of yeah, those. You, you can communicate to those three professors, one of those three professors, to file your ticket. And you yeah. Call. But they are limiting the communication between cadence and our side. Yeah, so that way we're not being bombarded by all you students. But however your system is, just file the ticket and we'll get you a login. Because okay. it's important. What's required to get on to support.cadence.com is you have to have licenses. And you guys get licenses, but if you're out at a customer site, you will have to have the license. You And we have some customers who feel that they're going to buy the licenses, but they're not going to pay for maintenance. Well, maintenance is the support.cadence.com and an AE. If you want to call an AE, that's the maintenance part that you pay. I had a customer who didn't want to pay that, so guess what? Their, their support site was shut down and their AEs. We were literally called and said, we can't. We cannot talk to them. So um, most customers pay for their maintenance because they give them that support site. And that's, there's a lot of information on that support. There's app notes out there and everything else. From all that simulation stuff that Shuga was showing you, all the stuff you're going to see on all these presentations, there's something out there that helps you. That we have a, a book out there that already tells you how to do it. And download those PDF documents. They're, they're valuable. And don't ever believe any founder when they say you can't move to 20. The only reason you couldn't move 20 is probably because they said, well, that's all we qualify. Well, they probably hard-coded something in that wrapper, too. They're smart enough, debug that wrapper and take out the thing that says it has to be 6.1. I just did it the other day for a founder. I said, no, I'm not running 6.1. I'm on 20. I'm going to go to 20, and then whenever we put out our next one in, Jan in June, I'm going to go to that one. Now, I don't care what the founder says. I'm going to go to it. You can't go behind. If they say ISR 23, you can't go behind 23, but you sure the heck should be able to go forward. Don't get fooled into that. Um, additional specific, you can read this, it's an eye chart for me. Um, better methodology, design, automation, and layout productivity. You need to put a methodology and plan. Plan and plan and plan. Sit down with yourselves, if you're going to do your own layout, put down some various transistors and see if you can get a DRC clean when you're running FinFET technology. Make something small, six transistors, try to lay it out and see if you can get it. Six different size fins, see what happens, just do what you got to do. Run some simulations. Find out if I can get away with just using two sizes of devices and get my block to work. But run it. And it, it, the same thing holds true for even advanced nodes. There's no reason to have every single size of device. If you can just open that, stack that device up, I don't need one big one. I can stack it out. And it, even in mature nodes, like I told you, I worked in mature nodes doing a lot of layout. And I would go back to the engineer. These things are so off size. Can't you make them all the same size? He'd bitch and moan, or she, but gripe, but then go out there and change them all, and the circuits would come back. I had more chips come back first so they can pass, meaning specs, because I was OCD. I wanted the layout to look nice, and I would go back and negotiate with the, with the designer. Come on, you got to make this look better. You can't have everything like this. Just take a little time and run some different simulations and stack these devices. And it works, so you'll, you'll even beat spec if, you're very, if you plan ahead. You, you shouldn't be surprised when wafers come back. That's that. Any other questions? We finished early, so it's your question time. Anything you want to see? I have Virtuoso. I can turn it on in a heartbeat. I have a couple of electrical questions. So is there any plans of releasing Virtuoso that is compatible with Red Hat 8? Because all the companies... Yes, it, it'll come out in... Um, you can use Red Hat 8 right now. They just say it's not. Yeah. You, know, you, you use it at your own peril. But yes, our next major build, which will be in June, unfortunately. We will, because it's a lot of work, and we've already got the platform established for the 20, so it'll come out when we make our next major build. And then it'll probably be on whatever OSs they have planned for the future. It's just really hard because this one's been established way back, you know, a few years ago to just all of a sudden change underneath. But it should work. If there's issues, just let us know. But they are working on it. The next major release is out in June, and that one will happen. So yes, sir. Yeah, I, I was on question about the job because I see there are se uh, uh, many similar uh, uh, concerns between the uh, physical design engineer and the application uh, engineer. So I want to ask whether they have some difference between these two kinds of jobs. Yeah. 
You have to say that one more time. Because I don't yeah, because I see, uh, see there are some senior content about the physical uh, desire uh, and the application uh, design of uh, the EDA company. And uh, in the, for example, the PSLC about the physical design. And so I want to ask you whether they have some difference between this uh, job. Uh, Oh, oh, okay. What are the difference between like a designer and a physical designer? Uh, or the application. Uh, well, the application uh, engineers usually like I'm considered an application engineer. Yeah. My job is supposed to be is that I'm to help you guys apply the software that you have purchased. The last thing Cadence wants is you go to company X Y Z, you spend three million dollars on some software, and it was your budget, right? Because you're a startup company, and that was everything you had. And then you can't get it to work. It's my job and several of us to make sure you get your bang for the buck. Because my job is to make sure you're using it effectively. Because Cadence wins when you get your job, when your chip goes out on time, first till it can pass, that's a win for us. Because we showed you that if you do it, if you use our tools, the simulations, the layouts, all of that stuff helped you, and your chip came back working. That's a success for us. If you can't get a chip out using our products, you're not going to want to buy us, and you're not going to have any justification to ever come back to us for another one of our products. So as an application engineer, no matter what company you go to, whatever they are selling, you're supposed to help whoever the buyer is use it. Because no one wants buyer's remorse. How many have bought something and really regretted buying it? Well, when you spend, when you sign a contract, there are people who sign $25 million contracts with Cadence. The last thing they want is a $25 million buyer's remorse. And Cadence doesn't want that either. I want you to, sorry about I just hit that. I don't want you to feel that you got ripped off. And as a good application engineer, whether you're at TSMC, you're probably sending an application on how to use their PDKs or something like that. It depends on the founder. As a designer, as a layout designer, if you are strictly layout design, and in the FinFET world, there's even guys doing layout design that are PhDs because there's so much physics going on. They are studying everything. They're sitting somewhere, placing things on test chips or whatever else, and taking it out to the lab. They're doing their layout because they want to see what happens when it comes back from the lab. And they're doing all this scientific study. That's why you guys are the future. If you haven't seen FinFET, you are going to see it. And some of you will probably be the ones deciding on how the world is when those, when you remember, you want to make your widget look different? Well, you're limited on some of the physics you're going to study those physics to, to hell and back to make sure that you can make your widget different from someone else's and justify the cost of whatever you're selling. So, Did I answer your question? So, you know, we have to end at 1.40 or so, but I do want to mention something. Nancy, thank you. Amazing you're welcome. Job. I also want to mention something. Um, we had only an hour and something, so Nancy did so much. She covered so much in this one and a half hours or less than two hours. So. If there are specific topics in here, just focus only on advanced node, or focus on, on anything in layout compliance, or any part of layout, or if you guys are, say, using only Virtuoso L, and you can't really use advanced node, or you just moved to Excel, not sure how to, you know, do some of the productivity enhancements. Doesn't matter which node you are, but mature node, advanced node. Let us know or let your faculty members know, like Constantine, let Michelle know, or uh, Constantine, Hossein, um, uh, Michael, any one of them. Then we can do a follow-up session on deeper dive on those two or three topics. Because today Nancy wanted to cover everything and she did an amazing job. But you guys probably have follow-up on specific things. So let your professors know so we can you know, do a more Deeper dive on a couple of topics. You want to learn what modgens are. What's the synchronous clone? Design plan. Yep, design. I know only a few things in layout. I but know. synchronous <laughs> clone is a big one. That's what if you have a very symmetrical circuit? You built half of it. You want to stay XL compliant, but you don't want to build the other half. See, so what do you do? You make a copy of it. What you do? You broke XL compliance. See, what you do is you grab that thing and you say synchronous clone. And you make it a clone, it looks at your schematic or your layout, depending on whether or not you have the devices in the lab, and it will literally clone that based on those other matching devices, and boom, you're still, you, you, you select the new one, it matches the, what was synchronized. It's called a synchronous, and if you make it a synchronous clone, if you edit one, it edits the other one. So if you got a very repeated structure, I literally yesterday showed a lady 
she had this huge structure, repeated structure. And she goes, how do I get this XL compliant? I just made a copy of it. Because she made it, got it all nice and neat and tucked in, and, and needed 10 more rows of that. It was, the schematic was just 10 of those repeated. But she broke XL compliant the minute she copied it. I said, how about we do this? How about we select those guys, delete everything else, let's go synchronous clone. It brought it up, I said, search for them, it found them, stacked them all in, and said, let's place it as an array. How about we do um, eight columns, and we'll put them point, what, zero microns apart, or you want point oh one just so you can make sure you don't short anything up, because we haven't really looked at it. She goes, just put a point oh one in there. And we put it in, boom, it was done in a heartbeat, she could cross probe. Everything matched. And if she edits one, she goes, and I asked her, do you want to keep the routes? Because she had this nice striped grid route. No, 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 no. So we deleted them. And then she saw what I did, and she goes, could I have the routes in there? I said, yeah. All we'd have to do to show you is just take your cut line, use cut, and just instead of a rectangle, cut a line, cut all those routes. Now select the routes and those instances, blow away the rest of the stuff, synchronous clone. Now you got it, a butt zero, boom. They're all placed, all aligned, all routed. And if you edit one, because you decide you need to change the route, they all change. You don't have to go to every 10 rows or whatever else. I have guys doing it with stuff that's 100 devices. And they synchronize it. They build a single structure, and then they repeat that thing 100 times. So when they edit one of them, they all edit. So it's very, very handy. And, there's a, if, and synchronous clone has to have something from the schematic, because you're, you're basically synchronizing. If you want to copy, like just routing, then it's called synchronous copy, where you can actually, it's just a copy. That has nothing to do with schematic now. You want to copy the stripe of routes, because it's going to repeat 50 times. You, copy, you select them, synchronous copy, boom. And now, when you edit one block of those, they all edit. So if you decide to widen them up or move them apart, boom, they all change. So if you really did, remember I love when things say they match? This is a way to make sure if one matches, all 100 match. So there's a lot of things. If you want to learn about it, just let us know. And there's things I can show you. This is just PowerPoint headaches. I'd like to show you the actual layout tool working. That's where the fun is. And any of the things I talked about, support.cadence.com. There's a rack on synchronous clones. I took a guy who spent two, three days laying a circuit out. It's a very repeatable circuit. He comes in, and he was the stubbornest old fool you ever want to know. But he was a nice man. And I've been trying to tell him to say, XL compliant, XL compliant. And he comes up to me, OK, show me something, because this sucks. I spent all three days trying to get this thing hooked up, and it's just a repeated thing. Show me how to be XL compliant and do that. So in two hours, not only did we lay it out, we laid it out like eight different times in two hours when I showed him how to do that. Something that took him two days or to do one circuit, I showed him how to lay that circuit out eight different times with different requirements that he decided. Because I was using cloning. He made a base thing that just kept growing. And I said, let's make the base one, and then we'll just grow it. And then he, oh, can I add this in? Yeah, so let's start all over. He added more things in. And, then, and he's like, he got done. His boss sat right across the way, and he goes, this stuff really is good stuff. I like <laughs> Excel compliant. After five years of going in and working with this guy, he finally said it was worth it. So this stuff really can change your life. Something that he took two days to lay out. We did it eight times, different styles. And he was so happy because we did it. He built five transistors together and decided what he wanted. And then he's like, oh, you know what? I need to put more space in. I can add the routes. Yeah, you can put the routes in there too. So then he says, well, OK, let's put it in and stretch it out. And he put a bus through there and everything else. So he just had to abut everything. And it was all hooked up. All he had to do at the end was put the pins at the top low. It took him three clicks and he was done. Once he had that base structure built. So there are some really powerful stuff. If you guys learn to use it, you will, you will be the envy of others. And they will be coming knocking on your door. Just don't blow it off because you used to do it this way all the time. You're too young to always, this is how I do it. You're way too young in your careers to, this is how I do it. Be willing to open. You guys are on the cusp of everything changing in the industry. You are the cusp of that industry change. So be ready to change. And virtuoso layout is a gold standard for yep. pretty much all commercial customers, yep. aerospace customers. But you are, the, you are the future, and you are changing. Why, this is why the industry is rapidly changing. You are about ready to jump into something where the future is just, I'm, I, I am blown away by what is coming out and what you guys are coming up with and the designs that are coming out there. So don't get stuck in this is the way I've always done it. 
I literally just worked with a guy and I've been doing this for 20 years. Yeah, well, I did that in 1980. We don't do that in, 19, in 2022. Let's not do that anymore. All right? So be ready for changes and be ready to change us because we want to help you be the best designers you can. And we want to take away the little tiny tedious work because tedious work should be automated. You guys need to work on the clever stuff. Help us help you become even more clever. All right. Thank you. Thank You're you, welcome. Nancy. Thank you. Bye. Bye.